On the flip side of Amazon's skyrocketing e-commerce growth, there's a mounting pile of e-commerce returns, hitting record numbers and record costs for retailers and the planet. We're talking about billions and billions and billions of waste that is a byproduct of consumerism run amok. One survey found a record $761 billion of merchandise was returned in 2021, which would mean returns cost more than what the U.S. government spent on all national defense last year. And Amazon sellers told us they simply throw away about a third of returns. Meanwhile, Amazon is making returns easier and easier for its 200 million plus Prime members. Customers can go to Kohl's and UPS store, as well as Whole Foods Market. And by scanning a QR code, they can leave their return without the packaging and label that was previously required. So it's all about making it easy for the customer and making it convenient as well. And sometimes Amazon just tells shoppers to keep the item. The reverse logistics are always gonna be nasty because the merchandise in most cases cannot be resold as it was originally. The most expedient pathway is into a dumpster, into a landfill. But Amazon now says it's working toward a goal of zero product disposal. What motivated you to set that goal? I believe it's just our, you know, who we are and our size. I mean, I think Amazon has done some amazing things to be on the front lines of innovation. And there's some responsibility that comes along with that. So now Amazon has launched programs for reselling, liquidating, and donating returns to try and get there. We expect that uh, these programs will help to give a second life to more than 300 million units a year. We wanted to figure out Amazon's strategy for fixing returns. So we sat down with Sharice Armour, Amazon's head of returns in North America for her first ever public interview. It seems like a lofty goal. Are you daunted by the task ahead? I wouldn't say daunted. I think I'm excited by the task ahead. Armour first joined Amazon 12 years ago. I actually started in our Indianapolis uh, Fulfillment Center as an ops manager on a night shift. As she rose through the ranks, she often heard about the goal of zero product disposal. It was definitely something that we talked about for many years. But at the same time, researchers were finding that making returns easy is good business. An often cited 2018 survey of 1,300 online shoppers found 96% would come back to a retailer if they had a good returns experience, and 69% were deterred from buying if they knew they'd have to pay for return shipping. So in 2019, Amazon expanded free, easy returns to millions of items. Amazon has really been a game changer in the reverse logistics world because of how easy their returns are. And so now you have your more traditional retailers like Walmart or Target implementing similar policies because that's a really big piece of how you compete on the retail side of it. Zach Rogers ran returns for an Amazon subsidiary called Quidzy from 2010 to 2012 before he started teaching at Colorado State. I had a student in my class last year and she said, oh yeah, you know, I, I was going to my brother's wedding and I ordered nine dresses knowing I was just going to keep one. And for Amazon, they're fine with that because their opinion is, yeah, we have to deal with the return and that's going to be a hassle for guys like me who are a returns manager in a warehouse. But in general, what that does is it creates loyalty to the brand, makes you more likely to sign up for Prime, and Prime is really the thing that drives the flywheel. Despite better sales on the front end, there's a high back end cost of so-called free and easy returns. U.S. returns generate an estimated 16 million metric tons of carbon emissions and create up to 5.8 billion pounds of landfill waste each year. How do you answer those numbers? What is Amazon doing to try to cut back on how much waste is created by returns. At Amazon, we encourage a second life on all of the products that you know we receive back. And that comes in the form of selling the majority of the items that we do receive, they are resold as new and used, or they go back to the seller or supplier or we donate them. There are a, a number of items that we can't recover or are not recyclable. And for reasons such as legal reasons or hygienic reasons or even product damage. And in those cases, we do pursue uh, energy recovery for those items. Energy recovery means you burn something to produce heat, to produce energy, and you rationalize disposal of goods as a conversion from one form of matter to another. To the degree they're doing that, I don't think they fully reveal. It is our absolute last resort, both economically as, fair, as well as um, environmentally. And why is that? Because of the fact that I, I, I believe that, that we have so many other opportunities. I mean, we are expanding programs 
all the time to not just enable Amazon owned product, but as well as our sellers, the ability to provide a second life. When I think about some of the investments we've made over the last couple of years, I'm super proud of what we've done. Some examples, in 2019, we launched a program where we allowed our FBA sellers to do direct donations to local charities instead of returning excess and returned product. In 2020, we launched a liquidation program, which gives our sellers an opportunity to recoup some of the costs that are associated with excess inventory as well as returns. And then also in 2020, we launched a grade and sell program that gives our sellers for the first time an opportunity to sell their returned product. When a return comes in and a seller chooses to resell it as used, Amazon gives it a grade. Like new, very good, good, or acceptable. Then resells it on a special section of its site. There's warehouse deals for used goods, Amazon Renewed for refurbished items, Amazon Outlet for overstock, and a tongue-in-cheek daily deal site called Woot that sells a $10 bag of crap and describes itself as a wild outpost on the fringes of the Amazon community. It does prevent them to have to take in excess inventory, receive product back and having to you know, manage the storage on their own. So it truly is an opportunity to remove waste from a process. More than ever before, offering a good choice to rehome returns is also a necessary choice for the bottom line. Amazon wouldn't share its returns numbers, but in 2021, more than 16% of all merchandise sold during the holiday season was returned, up more than 56% from the year before. For online purchases, the average rate of return was even higher at 20.8%, up from 18% in 2020. With $469 billion of net sales revenue last year, Amazon's likely returns numbers are staggering. Let's assume a 20% return rate, that's $93.8 billion of returns coming in. If instead of getting pennies on the dollar from a salvage dealer, you could get maybe 30 cents on the dollar from strategic targeted disposition, that bumps us up to 28 billion dollars. And so at $28 billion, having Woot or Amazon Outlet, now that makes a lot more sense because we're really starting to get a return for our investment. Before when we were at a small scale, it's like, hey, this is trash, <laughs> get, get rid of it. Now when we get bigger, they're scaling to the point where monetizing those returns would actually be, it'd be irresponsible not to. And Amazon is not alone. There's a boom in the secondary market, thanks to mounting pressure from younger shoppers who want sustainable shopping options and a supply chain backlog causing a shortage of new goods. We just finished calculating the 2021 secondary market, which was $688 billion in 2021. So it's up fairly significantly. As secondhand items go from a losing proposition to a potential moneymaker, Amazon is even offering customers gift cards to trade in their used Amazon devices for the chance to refurbish and resell them. Amazon also partners with major third-party liquidators like Liquidity Services, which takes returns off Amazon's hands and auctions them off on the secondary market. The liquidation option, why does that option make sense? Well, there's some products that we just can't donate and we can't give a second life to. Some of those items are due to hygienic reasons, legal reasons, or just they're just too damaged. In addition to that, there are some items that we cannot sell to third party customers, but we can sell them to liquidators that can sell to their customer. And that's where it makes sense. Another avenue for Amazon to make its way towards zero product disposal is donations. In 2021, we received just over 56 million items through the donation channel from Amazon alone, and that was three times what we did in 2020. Amazon partners with nonprofit network Good360 to handle U.S. donations. So we work with about 400 companies who have excess product or consumer returns, and then we also help those companies keep those goods out of landfills. Good360 says Amazon is its biggest corporate donor. Sellers can opt in to automatically donate eligible overstock and returns to Good360's network of more than 100,000 nonprofits who get access to Amazon donations after paying a freight cost and agreeing to certain rules. They're not going to be reselling those items, putting them on online auction sites, taking them to local flea markets or that sort of thing. So protecting that brand integrity of our donors is really central to what Good360 does. 
And then there's the potential tax write-offs that can come with donating to a nonprofit. Amazon has gotten heat for not paying a lot of taxes in the past. Are they able to write off the value of all of the goods that are channeled through Good360? The short answer is no, probably not. But we encourage our donors to explore that and understand with their tax experts what is possible because there are some programs that, that are available. I don't have any visibility into what the Amazon team is taking advantage of, if anything. By liquidating or donating returns locally, Amazon also saves big on transportation costs as gas prices hit record highs. Good360 says it connects more than 230 Amazon facilities with a nonprofit in their area. That nonprofit is picking up goods on a regular basis. And then what they're able to do is, is sort the goods themselves and distribute it within their community, keeping the impact local, also keeping the carbon footprint down because we're not transporting those goods to yet another leg that might be unnecessary. To understand how much fuel returns eats up, let's look at the complex reverse logistics journey. First, a return has to get from your home, or the coals where you dropped it off, back to one of Amazon's growing number of return centers. There, Amazon workers, like Shay Machen, have about a minute to give it an initial inspection. Computer will go through a series of questions that you have to answer about the item. It could be looking at it, it could be looking for factory seals or damages, spills, leaks, all that kind of stuff. And then dependent on what it comes up with, with those questions, the computer will determine where this item needs to go. If Amazon's algorithms determine it can't be sold as new, the return leaves the Amazon warehouse for several more legs on a truck, plane, or cargo ship. It heads back to the seller for further processing, then it could head back to another Amazon warehouse for sorting and repacking, then on to a new customer who could always choose to return the item again. They're gonna do it for their own self-interests, although they'll couch it in the name of saving the planet. But at the end of the day, their action is gonna be based upon the economics of what we're seeing. Processing a return can cost retailers up to 66% of an item's original price. Amazon spent nearly $152 billion on logistics in 2021, nearly a third of all net sales. That's up from $119 billion in 2020. So it's trying to offset this in a couple ways. In February, Amazon raised the annual price of Prime membership for the first time since 2018, from $119 to $139. It also increased fulfillment services fees for its millions of third-party sellers in January. And it started telling customers to keep some returns rather than shipping them back. If I tell you to keep the product instead of counting the cost and the carbon effect of taking it back, I look better as a company, don't I? Let's let the people keep it, and then it doesn't count against us. But now you, as a consumer, what do I do with this thing, right? There's also bad actors who take advantage of the increasingly lenient returns policy. The National Retail Federation estimates more than 10% of returns are fraudulent something America Martinez has seen during her return center shifts at Amazon, where she's worked every holiday season since 2017. I had some Beats headphones. Somebody said, those are expensive, and it looks like the box was not open. But if you look closely, the factory seal had actually been opened up. And so I just opened it up. I looked inside the box, and there was just a cheap, set of headphones inside. We take action on bad actors that abuse our customer-friendly programs. Um, and sometimes that means denying a refund uh, and a return, and sometimes it means closing accounts. The convenience of shopping on Amazon has also normalized other customer behaviors that lead to more returns. I don't want to have to go to a store and try something on. So I'll have the retailer, Amazon or someone else, send it all to me in a variety of sizes, colors, and silhouettes. And I'll, in the comfort of my home, check out what looks best, what feels best, send the rest back. Maybe send it all back. Amazon even has a prime try before you buy program specifically designed to make this exact process known as wardrobing even easier. We try to make returns as easy as possible for our customers by providing return labels right in the packaging when they receive the product. But reverse logistics experts say this is working in opposition to the long-term answer to returns. People are focused on how to process them, what to, what to do with them, as opposed to how to prevent them. We just don't do enough of that. There's going to have to be a concerted effort to slow this train down and to A, provide consumers with far better information so they make more successful choices at the outset, and B, and this is never going to be popular, and I don't know who's going to be the first one to uh, 
to raise the flag, but, but create disincentives to returning goods. Armour says Amazon does try to prevent returns, but remains committed to making them easy when they do happen. We want to make sure that our customers have all the information that they need to make the right shopping decision for themselves. But on the other side of that, when those decisions don't line up with the customer expectation, we want to make sure that we remove all barriers into making it right. If the process wasn't free and easy, returns would drop. But so would Amazon's customer numbers, at least at first. The industry at large would bow down to Amazon in a heartbeat if Amazon were to start to charge for returns because it would give them air cover to do the same. But that won't come easily for a company that describes itself as customer obsessed, which means Amazon's goal of zero returns disposals remains elusive for now too. Amazon has said there's a goal for zero product disposal. Can you tell me when you hope to reach that goal? We're constantly evaluating what we need to do and how to get there. But so for myself, I don't have uh, any information on that right now.